Welcome to worship today from our churches around the Cars of Gowrie, west of Dundee. Last week, we sat at the wedding table and Jesus thought about seating plans. And then after that, he went on to tell a story. And that story is what we're thinking about today. So, welcome. Whoever you are, however you're dressed, whether your life is busy or quiet, whether you're home or away, welcome because you're greatly loved and because God invites you to worship. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray. God of life, you invite us to draw near to you. In our waking hours, we praise you and thank you for the rest of the night. We come to be renewed by your Spirit and to be re energized in our faith. So speak to us and breathe in us, we pray. Your welcome, O oh God, is so amazingly open. We rejoice in your welcome. You invite and you embrace no matter our faults and our failings. It's like the calling of the first disciples that Jesus chose not to be perfect, nor the proud to do his work, but ordinary people with open hearts. We take solace in it. We pray, may we each hear Christ's call upon our lives in our worship today. O oh God, we bring to you those things which rest heavy on our hearts, things we have failed to do, things we wish we had not done, words we wish we could take back. Forgive us and restore us, Lord, to face again the new day with hearts ready to serve. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. There was once a man who was giving a great feast to which he invited many people. 
When it was time for the feast, he sent his servant to tell his guests. Come, everything is ready. But they all began, one after another, to make excuses. The first one told the servant, I have bought a field. I must go look after it. Please accept my apologies. Another one said, I have bought five pairs of oxen and am on my way to try them out. Please accept my apology. Another one said, I have just got married and for that reason I cannot come. The servant went back and told all this to his master. The master was furious and said to his servant, So hurry out into the streets and alleys of the town and bring back the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Soon the servant said, Your order has been carried out, sir, but there's room for more. So the master said to the servant, Go out into the country roads and lanes. Make people come in so that my house will be full. I tell you all that none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. never sure whether I like Jesus' story of the great feast or not. Getting back, as I am now into active schoolwork again, one of the things I look forward to doing with children once more is acting out their own versions of Jesus' parables. And this one is one that I use sometimes. Tomorrow, recording this for the Sunday, we finally get the results of the Conservative leadership election. I remember doing this parable one year with a class and they had planned it the day before a general election, so before we knew who we'd have won, in order to act it out a week later when the new government had been elected. And the class had planned a scenario where the new prime minister was giving a party and had invited all the rich and powerful to come and celebrate with them. And then one by one, they made their excuses. The American president had an oil crisis to deal with. The pop star had ten other parties to attend. Superman was answering a cry of distress. The football manager had call-offs to deal with, things like that. So instead, the new prime minister invited all the ordinary people, those who had voted for them and those who hadn't. And especially, they invited the poorest, the disadvantaged, and those who never get invited anywhere near Downing Street. And in the children's version of the story, our new prime minister realised that these were the ones who were important. Yes, it's a good story, but I can't ever be entirely comfortable with it. None of Jesus' stories are really comfortable because they come too close to the bone. It would be nice to think I was always on the right side, but actually, Jesus' demands are high, and it's unlikely that they're never directed at us. Have I ever made excuses not to go somewhere I was invited? Well, yes, I have. And have I ever excused myself out of an invitation of God's? Well, probably that too. Sometimes our own activities are just too comfortable and God's demands don't always fit in with our priorities. But there's also a whole other side to this story that until relatively recently, I had missed. We hear Jesus' stories with our 21st century Scottish ears and sometimes our limited knowledge of the Old Testament. One reason that I like to act out these stories with school classes is that it helps them think through what the story really means for us. 
And rather than just being about donkeys and innkeepers and scattering seeds, instead they might be about football teams or motorbikes or reality TV and a trip to the supermarket. Some time ago, one of my retired colleagues, David Kellis, produced a little book called Just Stories, which are stories that Jesus told, but recounted by one of the disciples who was there at the time and could tell the context and put in a bit of the background that we sometimes miss. And they're fascinating. So let me tell you about this particular parable. We read it, and you've likely heard it before. There was a man giving a great feast. And when the time came, he sent round his servant to remind people, no clocks, no diaries, no telephones, no email. And one by one, they all gave their excuses. Do you remember what they were? One had bought some land. Another had bought some cattle. A third had just got married. And none had yet had time to spend with the new things. They're good enough excuses. Though surely they could have waited. Well, could they? Listen to this from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20. It's the officer addressing his troops before battle. Then the officers will address the men and say, Is there any man here who has just built a house, but has not yet dedicated it? If so, he is to go home. Otherwise, if he is killed in battle, someone else will dedicate his house. Is there any man here who has just planted a vineyard, but has not yet had the chance to harvest its grapes. If so, he is to go home. Otherwise, if he is killed in battle, someone else will enjoy the wine. Is there anyone here who is engaged to be married? If so, he is to go home. Otherwise, if he is killed in battle, someone else will marry the woman he is engaged to. So three categories were excused. Property, farming, wife. In these circumstances, a man was excused his call-up. No, it's not chance. And yes, all Jesus' listeners would have known exactly what he was referring to. These were the traditional excuses, and they were permissible, sanctioned by God in the Bible. It was all right to say no in these circumstances. So Jesus is taking the established biblical excuses and saying, These are no longer sufficient. Those who adhere to the old ways will miss out. And then Jesus gives us a new list. Those who are invited instead. The poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Well, guess what? These are an Old Testament list too. This time from the book of Leviticus, chapter 21. The Lord commanded Moses to tell Aaron, None of your descendants who has any physical defects may present the food offering to me. This applies for all time to come. No man with any physical defects may make the offering. No one who is blind, lame, disfigured or deformed. No one with a crippled hand or foot. No one who is a hunchback or a dwarf. No one with any eye or skin disease. And no eunuch. According to the old law, No one with a physical defect was allowed to approach the holy place of God and take part in the food offering. So once again, Jesus' audience would all have known that law, which was well enforced at the time of Jesus, and he's blatantly overturning it, saying that these are precisely the people who are welcome to eat with God and to sit down at God's table at the highest, not the lowest places. Jesus' parable is overturning the old laws. And he was telling it at a meal hosted by a leading religious holy man where all his friends were invited to. Jesus is taking the teaching of the Bible, for the Bible at that time was what we call the Old Testament in Christianity, and saying what's written there no longer applies. Just as he did with the old eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth saying, which he threw out, or the old covenant of circumcision and outward purity laws. And in their place came the inclusion of all people, whoever they were, in God's welcoming grace. Jesus upset the people he was eating with. The people who had invited him to their home and given him and his friends a meal. Not very good manners. Not very grateful. But Jesus does that. 
He's not concerned about convention, but is concerned with the truth. And I think it was really important to him to try and get through to people that things are different now with the kingdom of God. There is a new relationship with God. Come, he says, come to the feast. All of you, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever your background, whatever your circumstances, whatever your sexuality, he overturns the old restrictions and says, come. And to those who might expect to be invited first, who've heard the invitation for longest and responded and followed, well, he makes it clear that they don't have any special privileges or rights. Come, all of you, whoever you are, come to God's party and leave the seating plan to God. And it is a party. It's quite astonishing how often Jesus attends and speaks of meals and feasts and parties. Heaven for him is one big party. But in that, he's not tearing up the Old Testament or even reforming it. For the Old Testament agrees with him about parties all the way. Come, you are invited. Don't say no. A poem from the book Present on Earth called I Did Not Know His Name. I did not know his name when he said, come, and took my arm in his and led me to my gate as if the house were his and I the guest. I did not know his name when he said, listen, and spoke of other folk I never knew, but who were soon to come and knock my door. I did not know his name when he said mine and asked for loaves of bread, a glass of wine and two small copper coins for one old dear who'd just arrived. I did not know his name when he said take and at my table with his friends he broke a roll and shared his glass and said this is for you and sung a love song to us all. I never knew his name until he rose to leave and kissed me on the brow and said, I'm with you always now. I said, my Lord, he keeps his word. God is good. We sing and shout it. God is good. We celebrate. God is good, no more we doubt it, God is good, we know it's true, and when I think of his love for me, my heart fills with praise and I feel like dancing, for in his heart there is room for me, and I run with arms open wide, God is good, we sing and shout it, God is we celebrate, God is good, no more we doubt it, God is good, we know it's true. Let's pray. Beloved God, we praise you for your words that creates worlds, your breath that brings forth life, your voice that inspires oceans and rivers. You are the source of all life. Every creature, great and small, is made by you and loved by you. In the beginning, you proclaimed all of creation to be good, and human beings you declared very good. Yet too many do not know that. We pray this day for all of those, your children, who do not know their goodness, their worth, their value, who do not know that they are loved unconditionally by the one who created them. We remember those who are hungry, who feel neglected by the world, those who live in war zones, who feel abandoned by their own people and people around, those who live and die in material poverty, those who live and die in a poverty of love, and those who live and die in spiritual poverty, may they know the length, breadth, height and depth of your love. And may our love be reflected in our actions. We pray that we also might never forget our own worth and value 
as your beloved children. We give thanks that in Jesus, your living word, you call us to discipleship a new life. And we pray for the church as we seek to follow you. Help us as Christ's disciples through words of compassion and cries for justice, through gentle smiles and hugs and arms that reach out to break barriers. Help us to proclaim the truth that all of your children are loved and valued and welcome at your table. In a moment of stillness, we bring our own prayers to you for what lies on our hearts. These and all our prayers we bring in Christ's name. Amen. From this time dedicated to God's worship, we now go into our daily lives 
there to live the values of God's kingdom. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you and those around you, now and forevermore. Amen. God is good. We sing and shout it. God is good. We celebrate. God is good. No more we doubt it. God is good. We know it's true. And when I think of His love for me, my heart fills with praise and I feel like dancing. For in His heart there is room for me and I run with arms open wide. God is good. We sing and shout it. God is good. We celebrate. God is good. No more we doubt it. God is good.